join us. Uh, hello again, everybody. I'm Beth Wemmelgloss, the program coordinator here for the Historical Society. Um, it's wonderful to have you all joining us for another of our virtual lecture series. And uh, before we get started, I did just want to give a brief update on the Historical Society. Um, we have just a ton of programming going on this summer. Um, we have three talks here in June, um, this one, of course. We have another one on June 23rd at three o'clock, and that is with me, uh, yours truly. I'll be doing my History of Harbor Springs lecture, uh, again, online. Then uh, the next day on June 24th, Eric Hemingway is joining us to talk about the Odawa connection to water, and that's going to be um, the 24th at seven o'clock. I did put a link over in the chat to uh, our uh, our events page so that you can check out all of those lectures and when they're going to be occurring and um, also just take a look at all the other events we have coming up. Um, our walking tour for tomorrow is sold out. However, we do have one next Friday. It's a natural history of Harbor Springs walking tour. It takes about an hour and a half or so um, and all around Harbor Springs led by Doug Fuller. And that's on June 18th. We still have some spaces available for that. And again, you can register on our website, um, on our events page. Coming up later this summer, July 1st, is our ninth annual Blessing of the Fleet event. Uh, I can't believe we're in our ninth year already. Uh, we hope that you will join us for that boat parade on the harbor, um, welcoming any type of vessel that you would like to bring from kayaks to motorboats and sailboats. So, uh, and then of course we have Shea Days later on in July yet again, um, July 16th and 17th. Our first in-person history talk will take place on July 17th at the AHA, our newest exhibit in Shea Park um, of Ephraim Shea's uh, 1894 uh, 50 foot steel yacht uh, that we have just finished restoring. So that is just a little bit about what is going on at the Historical Society. Again, I very much encourage you to check out our events page um, and the other sections of our website to learn more. Find us on Facebook, on Instagram, and on YouTube. So without too much further ado, we will get into uh, what we uh, are all here to see. So uh, I am going to let our presenters introduce themselves and uh, take, take it away. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, thank you, Beth. And my name is Wayne Blomberg. I grew up in Northern Michigan, went through the Petoskey school system. And I also attended NCMC for a couple years. At that point, I decided to make Northern Michigan my permanent home. And in 1986, uh, my wife and I uh, were able to buy Wrighty Marine in Ponchaline from her parents who had operated it for about 20 years. And I felt fortunate to have been able to work around the water and around people having fun. And uh, my interest in history had always been there, but working around people that maybe had family ties for a lot of years, uh, I kept hearing bits and pieces of information concerning the inland route, and it was pretty intriguing to me. And so little by little, uh, I got to learn a whole lot about it. And I guess at this point, we'll let Dave introduce himself. Hi, I'm Dave Pott. Uh, I'm a uh, volunteer at the museum. Um, I've been coming up here since 1965, and now I'm a per permanent resident in this uh, beautiful area. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, railroads and uh, how they affected the inland route. So uh, thanks very much for joining us on this uh, journey along the waterway this evening. Okay, uh, I guess at this point, I'd kind of like to talk a little bit about the organization that we belong to. Um, it's a relatively young organization and I thought it would be pertinent to at least say how a local museum got started in this instance. Um, one day when I was at the marina working, uh, it was lunchtime and I was sitting there eating lunch and a gentleman came up that I knew. Uh, his name is Mark Hill. And 
he needed some parts for a boat he was working on. And I started to get up to get him his parts. And he said, no, sit there and have your lunch and I'll wait until you're done. So we're sitting there and in the turnaround in our driveway, there was a huge anchor. And I, he asked a little couple questions about it. And I said, well, that anchor was recovered at a crooked lake in the mid 1970s. And that really got him going. Mark uh, grew up in Lansing and later uh, after schooling, uh, became an instructor at Ferris State University and teaching in their industrial arts program there. But he had a summer place in Northern Michigan and enjoyed history a lot having grown up in Lansing and realized that we both had a interest in it. Uh, it. It wasn't during our first conversation, but in subsequent conversations, we both uh, started to wonder if there was enough information and in interest in having an inland route museum. Uh, Mark knew that in other communities along the route, like Indian River and Tappanabee and Sheboygan, uh, there was not a museum dedicated specifically to the inland route. And so we wondered uh, if there was gonna be a museum, why not a Lansing? And so, we knew that uh, if anything was going to succeed in the Lansing area, we should talk to Tom and Jean Fairburn, which we did. And they suggested a meeting among uh, a few individuals. And uh, in 2004, we met for the first time in this very building. It was in need of renovation at that point. It was. Uh, derelict building that uh, if it didn't get fixed up soon, it was going to be torn down. So we met there and decided that indeed uh, we should go for it. Um, let's see, can we switch to number two? Okay. After we decided to form as a official organization, uh, we came up with a mission statement that is actually quite simple. And it reads there at the top, preserving and maintaining the history of the inland route. The inland route consists of uh, Crooked Lake, Crooked River, Pickerel Lake, Burt Lake, Indian River, Mullet Lake, Black River, and the city of Sheboygan is at uh, Lake Huron there. So the route consists of 38 miles of navigable water. There's also a small stream between Crooked Lake and Round Lake that connects the two, but it's not navigable. And actually there's another stream that flows into Round Lake. It's within a half mile of Lake Michigan. Yet all the water, originating in Spring and Mud Lake and Round Lake, makes its way through the series of lakes and rivers to Lake Huron, 38 miles distant. Uh, let's go to two, three. Okay, uh, this is uh, an inland route chart that was produced in 1914-15, and that is the very first navigable uh, chart. Up at the top, uh, you probably can't see it on your screen, but it says produced by the War Department. And in later years, that became the Army Corps of Engineer. And we have uh, two charts that look like this. Uh, they're very, very detailed. And if you think back to 1914-15, there were no aerial pictures being done at that point. And so 
all the markings on this chart that you see, water depths, even including out into Lake Huron. In the contour, <clears throat> excuse me, the contour marks around the lakes all would have been done by uh, uh, manpower and people being out there. And it took two years for them to compile that information. Uh, between Little Traverse Bay and Round Lake, there's some contour marks that mark the dunes of the Petoskey State Park, which I thought was pretty interesting as a kid. I grew up in that area and knew about the dunes and such. So if you look at the inset up in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see Sheboygan quite prominently displayed. Now, the European use of the inland route started in around the 1850s. So by the time this chart was produced, that was like 45 years later. And you can see in the city of Sheboygan, uh, let's see if I can find a pointer. Okay, right here, this uh, is an obvious dredging line out in Lake Huron. And uh, we have information that tells us that when the Europeans arrived, the mouth of the Sheboygan River was about two feet deep and about 50 feet wide. But the first industry to get going uh, on the inland route was logging and sawing logs. And so they needed to be able to access the big lake for shipping. And so in 1867 was the first dredging of the Sheboygan River. And in 1869, the locks were built in this area right here. And the reason uh, they chose that area, there was about a nine foot drop there that uh, facilitated building the dam and harnessing the water power to saw logs. So in this spot right here is an interesting contour marks. Uh, and keep in mind, logging logs were being sawn starting in the 50s, 1850s. So by 1914, 15, there was this pile of sawdust that was reputed to be the biggest sawdust pile in the world. And it stayed there for years and years uh, up into the 1970s. Uh, when the village or the city of Sheboygan decided to turn that into a marina area. But uh, local historians talked about the kids using that as their sledding hill. So I'm sure a lot of more disappointed when it was trucked away. Okay, we'll go to number four. Here's an inset that shows that uh, area of the current lock and dam uh, in the big sawdust pile. Uh, you can see the dredging marks out into Lake Huron. And these little black marks are numbers that signify water depths. And remember that all these were done with the lead weight and the rope. Uh, the next version of the inland route chart happened in 1920 and looks very similar to this one. We do have these for sale at the museum uh, and they're almost a work of an art, work of art in my opinion. So we talked a little bit about logging being the first uh, industry in Northern Michigan. And this panel has a lot of the tools of the trade and some pictures. Uh, this uh, is a tug called the Hinkley from the Colby Hinkley uh, lumbering operation. And it just so happens that the local family had ties to this company and they, those little tugs usually had a steam whistle, but they also had um, also had a hand whistle that was donated to the museum, and I thought you might like to hear that. 
so that's kind of fun. We let kids occasionally blow this, the whistle when they're in the museum. Okay. All right. Um, this is uh, what is called the log mark, and they were put in the logs as they were in the river floating. Uh, there might be a real mixture of logs from different companies. And I think the reason for three of them is so that no matter how the log is floating, they'd still be able to read uh, the log mark and know who it belonged to. We've heard stories uh, from a historian in Sheboygan, Ellis Olson, about uh, even in those days, there were some unscrupulous companies and characters that might saw the mark off and mark it with their own. Uh, uh, the gentleman that I just mentioned, Ellis Olson, was a historian in the Sheboygan area that wrote this book. And he called it uh, Wood Butchers of the North. And there was a lot of information in there regarding logging. And in the book, Ellis uh, was able to find log marks that were registered with the city of, or the county of Sheboygan. And during the time between 1860 and 1910, there was approximately 338 different logging marks being used. This picture is uh, on Crooked Lake looking toward the village of Alanson. And you can see, imagine the number of logs there. And they were all mixed up. They'd be towed into the mills when the mills required it. And, so they would get credit for the logs as they read the log marks. This is also in the village of Lanson, uh, the mill right there with the big stacks and also big stacks of lumber there. Uh, this uh, pile of short uh, shavings there, uh, yeah, right here, uh, oops. I think would be used for uh, fuel wood for steamers as they required in the early days. Later on, they would burn coal after the railroad came in. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave who has uh, got an interest in railroads and railroad history. And so he'll be talking about that. Thanks, Wayne. Uh... Um, and thanks, folks, for joining us on our little journey along the inland waterway tonight. Um, the waterway was reached by three railroads. Um, the first was the GR and I, Grand Rapids in Indiana, which later became part of the vast Pennsylvania Railroad Network. Um, the second was the Michigan Central Railway, which became part of the New York Central. Um, back to uh, the GR and I, that service. Uh, had stations at Conway, Odin, Ponchoang, and Alanson on the waterway with some um, smaller stations in between those. Now back to the Michigan Central, um, that had a station at Indian River and then stations along the uh, western shore of Mullet Lake. Uh, two of those uh, still exist. The library in, uh, in uh, Ponchoang is, uh, I'm sorry, in Toppenaby is, uh, is still there and the Mullet Lake um, uh, station is a private cottage. Um, the last one was a smaller railroad, the Detroit and Mackinac. They, they were kind of uh, late to the party. Um, uh, they reached Sheboygan in uh, 1905. Um, uh, they were pretty optimistic. Actually, uh, they never reached Detroit or Mackinac. They just ran between Bay City and, uh, and uh, Sheboygan, and their station was uh, Aloha, which is now a, a state park. Um, you, if you uh, remember, uh, during the 1880s, 
that was 20 years before the advent of uh, advent of the automobile and at least 35 years before affordable cars like Ford's Model T were available. Roads were terrible between towns, uh, often just sandy two tracks and there weren't many horses available. Uh, this was a transportation challenge, but it was met by the GR and I, the Grand Rapids and Indiana uh, Railway with their suburban trains. Uh, they were commuter trains and often called dummy trains. Um, Sorry, we got a little technical. Um, they were small trains. They weren't long distance trains and they're pretty simple. Um, they were made by the Baldwin Locomotive Company. Um, they had uh, the 440 configuration, which just means they had um, four wheels, two on each side and four drive wheels, two on each side and no wheels over the cab. The coaches were very, very simple. They were made out of wood. The seats were made out of wood and uh, they uh, were just uh, meant for short, short trips. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, this is a GRNI timetable from August uh, 1915, August 15th. And it shows the suburban um, uh, stations Petoskey, uh, Bayview, uh, Mononoqua, Ramona Park, Roaring Brook, Wequatonsing, and Harbor Springs around the bay. And then uh, the, the Hiawatha pageant, which Wayne will talk about, Odin, um, uh, Conway, Alanson, those stations that I mentioned. And there was also uh, suburban service or dummy trains to Wallen Lake. Um, the uh, train to Alanson, some would eventually go to uh, the dock at Mackinac Island where you could uh, where you could travel to Mackinac Island. At their peak, um, these little commuter trains ran through Bayview about every 20 minutes. So at least in the summer, um, we had uh, uh, as many, if not more commuter train service than the city of Detroit. This is a picture of the uh, um, dummy trains or the suburban uh, trains uh, at the station there was a separate station, a suburban station. Um, and if you were walking towards Mitchell Street, it would have been on the left-hand side. There's a parking lot there now. And Pennsylvania Park is on the right. If you would walk this way uh, towards the Perry, um, the station that's there now, it's called Pennsylvania Plaza, um, was actually for uh, the long distance trains and open year round. This was just a summer only um, uh, train service. Um, let me switch here. Okay. Um, this is kind of a treasure. Uh, one of our volunteers, Margaret England, who's uh, 80 plus years old, she runs our uh, docent program. Uh, her um, uncle was a station man master at um, the Alanson station. And you'll notice that uh, GR and I, then they call themselves the fishing line. Uh, th that symbol is no longer here. It's uh, now taken over by the Pennsylvania Railroad and that happened again in 1918. But these folks traveled from Petoskey, the conductor punched, punched it here and to a Lanson. And I think the round trip at that time was about 25 cents. Um, this is, uh, I love this picture. This was, we believe taken in 1920. You can see the uh, dummy train rounding the bend here. It's at Ponchawang. Um, this very proper lady is sitting up, uh, got great posture. And these two guys are standing up uh, and, you know, because they probably weren't invited to sit, sit down. So they're being respectful. Um, you can see this, uh, not the wooden platform that's gone, but the, the concrete platform is uh, right across the street uh, on the street that parallels 31 um, there's a, a party store there called the Fort, and you can still uh, see that. Uh, this is a beautiful station. This was at Odin. Um, obviously, everybody's in their summer wear. The ladies have on cotton or linen. Most of the guys are wearing ties, and uh, Wayne will uh, uh, talk about the importance of this station in relation to the steamers that would run from the dock in Odin. Um, this is my favorite station. This is 
the station of the Detroit Mackinac at Aloha. Um, it was a, a the DNM uh, was a log carrier, so the station was naturally made out of logs, even the interior, and we have shots of that at the museum. All the furniture uh, were carved out of logs. Real quickly, if uh, you've ever been to the Hackmatack uh, restaurant, um, whoops, on uh, on uh, uh, the Sheboygan River, you'll notice a similarity between the tower and uh, we're trying to get back to that picture, uh, the tower at the Hackmatack and the one at uh, that station. So um, we guess or surmise that perhaps it was the same architect or the same um, uh, builder. Um, one last story about the Detroit Mackinac. Um, they again came late to the party and uh, in 1905, they started building a track, their track into Sheboygan. Well, the guys from the Michigan Central didn't like that and they started a fight. And uh, they, uh, uh, the Michigan Central guys uh, won and uh, they uh, pushed a boxcar across the tracks that they were building to prevent them from uh, building their track, the DNM, into Sheboygan. But the citizens of Sheboygan banded together, got some horses, got some men, pushed that off because they wanted another railway to um, serve their town. So thanks a lot. And I'm going to turn it back to Wayne now. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, as uh, we talked about earlier, uh, the white pine was virtually gone from northern Michigan by about 1890. And there was still logging going on but not to the scale that it had been. And uh, a lot of the logging that was being done was uh, second cutting going after hardwoods, uh, which had to be, you can't drive a nail through it very easy. So it, it wasn't good for basic building material, but they would make uh, lots of different products out of hard maple and those sort of things, implement handles and in Lansing, there was a wooden bowl mill, uh, wooden flooring, uh, and that sort of thing. But the railroads who were established pretty well by then were looking to uh, for business ridership uh, since they weren't hauling logs like they had been. So they started promoting Northern Michigan as a tourist destination. And there was, uh, Clean, good clean air, good clean water, excellent fishing. So uh, the big push began to have some hotels built and get tourists up here. And this particular hotel uh, was actually built on Mullet Lake just prior to the railroad serving that part of Mullet Lake. And the owners of the hotel speculated and bought property on the east side of Mullet Lake and built this uh, lavish hotel. And when the railroad did go in and bought property, it went on the west side of Burt Lake or Mullet Lake. So this hotel was kind of removed from railroad uh, traffic. And they tried to exist for a while. They had a wooden bridge built, uh, but it was just far enough away that the hotel only lasted a few short years. And I'm pretty sure that some family lost a fortune in that endeavor. Uh, the hotel was torn down and shipped by barge to Sault Ste. Marie. Next. That's another actual picture of that hotel, maybe a little less extravagant than the artist's rendering be previous, uh, but it shows cutting ice out of mullet white for use in the hotel during the summer months, which was a common practice before electric power came in. It's a nice picture of uh, some steamers at the dock that was at the Mullet Lake House. Uh, most of these hotels, 
did end up building pretty substantial docks to attract steamer traffic. And the early steamers were sidewheel steamers, like the Northern Bell at the end of the dock there. There's a tug on the right here. Uh, I think the name of that tug, according to the picture, Major Dana. And then over on this side is the first propeller driven steamer that plied the inland route called the Mary. Uh, it's another hotel that was quite extravagant in the village of Odin. Uh, and Dave uh, pointed out that the train station in Odin was quite large and quite fancy. And it was probably due to the number of guests that were staying and using this hotel called the Atherton Inn, which was uh, designed by an artist. And we have a promotional booklet talking about the Atherton prior to it opening, but the balconies, uh, well, there were 60 rooms there total, but the balconies you see on the outside were also repeated on the inside facing an open courtyard. And in the evening, there would be enter entertainment in that area. There'd be bands, poetry readings, and that sort of thing. In this picture, the wooden dock there leads out to the, or wooden walkway leads out to the steamer dock. Next. This is another picture of the same hotel. Uh, we don't have a good picture in this presentation, but the side facing or the end facing the lake also had a boat livery underneath the hotel there. So you could just walk out of your room and go down and get a fishing boat for the day or the week or whatever. Uh, in the roof where the arrow is, uh, that promotional booklet talked about that being stained glass windows on each side that filtered light down into that open courtyard. And the booklet also spoke about a dining room that would seat 250 mm -hmm. people, which I'm not sure nowadays uh, if even that many families live in Oden. Uh, It's another pretty fancy hotel on Burt Lake called the Colonial Hotel. Uh, the point where it was built is still called Colonial Point. In the early days, it was called Indian Point, but took in the name after the hotel was built. Like many of the early hotels that used a lot of wooden construction, uh, they often had a fairly short lifespan due to fires that might take place. And this one burned, I believe it was 1919. Mm -hmm. And next. Uh, we'll come back to talking about the colonial, colonial point area uh, later in the program. But this uh, hotel was about a 20 room hotel in the village or area we call Panchawang. And they also had a boat livery and fishing was a big draw to that area. And you can see the catch being displayed there. Next. This hotel uh, was a recent gift to the museum a model of the Hastings Heights Hotel, which is on the west end of Crooked Lake off Graham Road up on a hill. And we were quite surprised to receive this as a gift. It had been in private hands for quite a number of years. And uh, they thought that our museum was uh, a better spot where more people could enjoy it. Next. 
So the area, the era that we're talking about, uh, we like to refer to as the hotel and steamer era. And it's, this picture is one of my favorites. It's one of the early steamers on the route, but that boat is called the Beautiful Irene, and it is 80 foot in length. And it's hard to imagine a boat that size being able to navigate the twists and turns of the Crooked River, but somehow they were able to do it. And there were bridges along the route, various places, and you can see the guy wires on the smokestack. And most of the steamers, if they had a tall stack, the stack would be hinged and it would have to be lowered to fit under the bridges. Next. Uh, this a uh, Beautiful shot that after probably 10 years of existence, the Inland Route Society, we thought we had seen all the early pictures. And Chris Drubel uh, knows Dave and told him he had a picture that he thought we would like to have. And uh, so this picture came into our possession just not very long ago. And we really would like to thank Chris. Uh, he has a strong interest in history and uh, doesn't mind sharing it with others and also operates the Arlington Jewelry in Petoskey on Lake Street. I suspect that in this picture, what we're seeing is uh, the little steamer giving way to the Odin, which uh, has kind of an in interesting story started life as a tugboat on the inland route. And when the logging dwindled and tourism picked up, they decided to cut it in half, add 20 feet and turn it into a passenger boat. And I like the burly captain in the pilot house uh, dressed with a vest and tie and in a hat. These flags that are being displayed on the boat would usually have the name of the intended stop for that particular boat. And so people on the docks and uh, places where the steamer would stop would know uh, the different spots that the steamer would be picking up or letting off passengers. Mm -hmm. And this is probably the most famous boat of the inland route uh, called the steamer Tapanabee. And they would do trips starting in Crooked Lake and travel to the village of Tappanaby where the guests would have lunch and then the boat would return back to whatever stop uh, that they had left from and time to catch the train back into Petoskey. Uh, you can see by the black smoke that they were burning coal the Tappanabee operated uh, the, on the inland route by the inland Hamels inland route line and from 1902 to 1910. So kind of a short number of years, but by 1910 tourism uh, was starting to drop off a little bit. Uh, often the double decker would carry a band on board for entertainment for the guests. Yeah, okay. Here's another picture of that same boat on Burt Lake, I think. Next. And I thought it would be appropriate, even though this picture is uh, quite a bit later from around 1956 or seven, uh, but to show the twists and turns of the Crooked River, that part didn't change much from the early days to think about those 80 foot steamers being able to get through that. I still don't know how they did it. Okay. This is uh, Tom Petoskey, who was uh, 
captain on the steamer for a number of years. And he was a uh, grandson of Chief Pettisiga. And I talked about the Tapanabee being owned by Dale Hamill, who was uh, a pretty shrewd businessman. And uh, he marketed himself as Hamill, the ticket broker. And he had an office on Lake Street and I can't remember the other street in Petoskey. And uh, he was quite a promoter. Uh, he operated, he had a couple boats in the early days prior to the Tapanabee that were 80 footers and they were named the Romeo and Juliet. And they would alternate, one would start out at uh, Tapanabe and the other one at Odin, and they'd pass each other somewhere along the way. But it was, the boats were slow and it would take you know, the better part of a day to uh, make that trip. Next. It's another promotional brochure. Uh, Hamill was uh, pretty ingenious and uh, Mark Hill was telling me somewhere about he had read that Hamill had a bicycle that he attached some kind of paint mechanism. And as he rode, this thing would follow the wheel on the bicycle and stamp on the sidewalks, Hamill the ticket broker and the inland route. And so he was trying to drum up business that way. In the Crooked River, he often would hire Native Americans to come on board and entertain guests. Uh, they would sell flowers or food or gift items that tourists could take home with them. And here's a schedule for the boat trips. Um, as I said, it would take the better part of a day. And sometimes in Tapanabee, guests would uh, not return that day. They would hop on a different steamer and might end up in the Straits of Mackinac or point a pin on uh, Bablo Island up there. Sometimes they would uh, return to a, uh, one of the Great Lakes steamers and head back home at that point. Next. And we touched briefly on uh, this Hiawatha pageant at Waiagamug, probably not saying that right, but uh, it was uh, quite an operation. And even though I grew up in Northern Michigan, I had never really heard much about this, but it took place on Round Lake, uh, right near where the GR and I railroad tracks pass the lake shore. And the railroad itself had purchased the rights to put this play on. It was originally developed up in uh, Garden River, east of Sault Ste. Marie by Chippewa Indians up there, but it took a cast of about 60 to 70 Native Americans to reenact Longfellow's poem, uh, Hiawatha. And there was a grandstand there that had seating uh, for I don't know how many people, but underneath they had gift shops and uh, food available. Early in the day, you could hire an Indian guide to go fishing on Round Lake in a birch bark canoe. So it was quite an operation. And the thing that really surprised me about it is the longevity of that uh, operation. They started producing the pageant in 1905, and it lasted 11 years uh, till 1916. It ran every day in the summer except Sunday uh, from the Memorial Day to Labor Day. So Mark Hill said that he has heard that there is a short video at the Smithsonian and. Washington DC concerning this play, but I haven't talked to anybody that has seen that. Someday I may get there. Next. 
here's a program that uh, I think was given to us by a gentleman that said he was remodeling his cottage on Round Lake and found it between the walls. Uh, but uh, in the land of the Ojibwe's, that uh, was uh, the emphasis on the Hiawatha pageant. It was Chippewa Indians that reenacted most of the time, but I think also some of the Native Americans locally also got in that at some point. And there's just another book that was given to the museum concerning, uh, got some real nice pictures in there of the play in different scenes. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but the play uh, took about three hours to perform. Next. And we're going back to the village of Alanson here. And we put this one in to show the early swing bridge. And it was a bridge, a steel bridge that replaced a wooden bridge that was uh, arched over the river. This built, this bridge was built in 1902 and it was hand operated. And Dave is gonna click or show the arrow on the mechanism they used to swing the bridge. It was a large T-handle thing that had a socket in the end of it and dropped into a socket and matching socket in the bridge and two people could turn it by hand. Uh, next, I think what the next picture also shows that a little closer up. You can see the mm -hmm. cool. two boys uh, turning the bridge for the bridge tender. Uh, So here's a close up of that key, uh, the tool they use to swing the bridge. And the gentleman in the hat is uh, the bridge tender, and probably a couple kids that like to help him do his job. Uh, we had heard uh, in the village when the museum came about that somebody knew that there was a key around somewhere, but Nobody knew where it was. And that went on for about a year. And then we found out that somebody knew where it was. They said, I think there's something like that behind the maintenance building at the cemetery. And so they went and checked. And sure enough, uh, next. We ended up getting that artifact. And you can see, uh, we had to cut the handle. Well, actually it's a replacement handle here, but the working end is down here. Uh, let's see, if I can get there. right there. And uh, that's how the bridge was turned. And that bridge remained until I believe it was around the mid seventies. It was replaced uh, by a electric hydraulic swing bridge. And that is still uh, one of the few swing bridges in Michigan. And people of Alanson kind of like that bridge and it does serve as a backup route, <clears throat> excuse me, backup route to M68 if major work ever has to be done on that bridge. Next. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's a picture of the swing bridge in the background and some kids having fun in the river. Kids still do that. I see them uh, pretty frequently in the river, never mind the boat traffic. And a big stack of wood there, late, uh, ready to ship somewhere. Thanks. Uh, we, speaking of kids, uh, there were quite a few. Uh, summer camps on the waterway at various points. And the Historical Society has a pretty good list of the name of the camps. They often had a theme uh, quite frequently Native American, but there was one uh, on Mullet Lake that was called Camp 
Kimosabi, and they called it the Lone Ranger Camp. Uh, there is a camp on uh, Pickerel Lake that existed for boys for quite a number of years, uh, funded by Jim Templin that eventually became the county park that it is today. And this is Colonial Point. After that hotel burned, there was a lady that purchased the property and built a summer camp there for girls. And back in those days, when you went to summer camp, it wasn't just a week or two, it was the whole summer. And they'd be taught uh, various things concerning growing up and becoming productive members of society. Uh, this is a great picture of the depot and uh, Brutus and the girls that either had just come or were en route to camp. Next. And another uh, industry that occurred down the inland route was boat building. And we got an interesting email one day at the museum, or maybe it was uh, a letter I don't recall, but it was a gentleman, Daniel Cook from Seattle, Washington. And he said that he had some tools that belonged to his great grandfather, who was a boat builder in a Lanson. And he asked if we were interested in them, and of course we were. And within about three or four weeks, we got a couple boxes and had all these wonderful woodworking tools from the early days. And there's a, from the M68 bridge in Lanson, you can look off downriver to the left. And there's a, a two-story boathouse there. And that was where Malcolm Cook lived in the summer. In the winter, he moved into Petoskey, he and his son. But these are uh, a couple boats that he had a hand in building. The one on the right is the pastime. And the one on the left is Merchant's Tug. And Merchant's was a lumbering operation in the village of Lanson. Next. And there was another one up at uh, Mullet Lake uh, where Hobart Marine was that began operations in about 1920, a gentleman would build these beautiful lap straight rowboats. And he built them uh, for a lot of cottage owners on Burt Mullet and a few even on Crooked Lake. I've never heard a number on how many built, but they would be different sizes but uh, beautiful boats that rode uh, with no effort. And he built boats right up until aluminum displaced wood boats. And back to the topic of fishing, we have uh, a panel in the museum with interesting lures and pictures. And let's zoom in, or next picture. And we'll zoom in to here. Uh, but this is a brochure that you, you, it doesn't show up, it's not big enough, but it says uh, it's from the Grand Rapids and in Indiana Railway that marketed themselves as the fishing line. Next. Two of my favorite exhibits in the museum, they're nautical and they fit the museum, but they show the scale of the boats that were being used on the inland route. And both of these items, this is the anchor that was in our turnaround at the, music, or the marina in Ponchoing. And it was donated in memory of Don Wrighty, who was uh, one of the ones that recovered it from Crooked Lake in the mid 1970s. It's about four feet high and it weighs well over 200 pounds. And then this next item is a very large propeller. And there's no way of knowing it's been researched uh, what boat it came from, but it also was recovered from Crooked Lake. And if you look close <clears throat> in the lower 
the prep blade mm -hmm. here, you can see a repair that had been done. And when the idea of the museum came about, I think it really came about because there, there was members in the group that wanted to recreate the experience for people. Uh, and a gentleman from Burt Lake surprised us with this model that he built, uh, not from a kit, but just by pictures. And it was a boat that we hope to acquire and have doing trips on the inland route. And the next slide shows that same boat mm -hmm. when we brought it to Alanson about three years ago. And we do trips on the river. Uh, it's not a public published schedule. If you do want to do a trip, you would need to talk to the uh, museum and arrange it. Uh, we can only take six passengers and two crew at this time, but uh, we are doing trips. Uh, so next. And I think that pretty much concludes our talk. Uh, we would like to thank Beth, who was uh, the one that instigated this thing. And we hope that you learned quite a bit about the Inland Route. I've been amazed at the scale of tourism uh, back in the 1880s, 90s, and early to, uh, 1900s. And it's just amazing to think of the number of people that got to experience the route, which was uh, advertised all over the country. Well, thank you both so much. We did have a few questions, if you've got a moment, sure. um, and, and one comment as well. But uh, the question, and you did answer this one, uh, I believe, a little bit. But back in the day, um, how long would it have taken to traverse the inland waterway? You said about a day. Is that because of stops and things? or Yes, yes. And it depended on which boat it was. Uh, you know, some made more steps than others. Uh, and the final destination as well. Uh, but nowadays, uh, I say that trip takes, in a modern boat, uh, it still takes about five hours to go from Crooked Lake to Sheboygan. But that's a boat that you can open up and travel at. 30 mile an hour on the big lakes. Right. The rivers are still mostly no wake speed. So it, each river takes about an hour to navigate. Um, and we have a question from Eric who wants to know if you have any information about the top of Michigan marathon race. Well, we do have some info on that. And any kid that grew up in the area seems to think that would be a fun thing to do at some point in life. And I'm one of those kids. Uh, I had the fortunate uh, experience of having a friend that grew up in Lanson, Tom Fairburn Jr., that raced for years. And he kind of got me involved. And last year, I ran the race for the 30th time and retired at the end of that 30th race. So is it, it's a, it's a marathon from? It is. Uh, the race is headquartered in Indian River nowadays and goes north to Sheboygan and back on Saturday and to the Crooked Lake end on Sunday. And so it's run over a course of two days. It takes about an hour and a half each day. And this year the race is, uh, I don't know the dates, but it's second week, second full weekend in August. I think it's about the 13th or 14th, right in there. And it's the last of the old time marathon in the US. Uh, it's the only one left. Uh, people come from all over the country and sometimes even a, a country outside the US to run this race. 
And we did have another question um, about the Inland Water Route Historical Museum. Uh, where are you located in oh, Elena? Yeah. Uh, everyone knows where Fairburn's Hardware Store is in Lanson. Uh, River Street is the street, if you're coming from Petoskey, just prior to Fairburn's and Tiger Lollies. And that's where the swing bridge is at, down River Street. The museum is the second building off the uh, highway. So you can sort of see it from the highway, but to go to the museum, you'd want to turn on River Street. And what are your hours right now? Hours are 10 to 2, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And we are, I didn't say it earlier, but we are an organization that is 100% volunteer run. Uh, we do have a museum that is uh, solvent and we retired the mortgage on the building in 2010. And that was what let us move on to that launch project, which required quite a bit of additional fundraising, but the community has been really supportive of not only the museum, but the launch as well. And we've been amazed by how much people seem to enjoy it. Uh, one final question here from Robert. He would like to know if you know anything about when and why the dam was placed at the junction of Crooked Lake and Crooked River. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one picture, if you remember, that looked like uh, the Crooked River winding toward Burt Lake, almost looked like snow uh, along the banks. It was actually dredging from the river that happened in what was called the big dredge. Uh, of It took two years, uh, 1956 and seven. And when they did that, it was like someone pulled the plug on Crooked and Pickerel Lakes. Uh, the, the lakes lost about 16 inches of water, which made many waterfront properties almost unusable for boating. And it took about two or three years for the Army Corps of Engineers to admit that dredging of the river was the culprit. And they agreed to put the lock and weir in and that was completed and open for business in 1968 and still operates to this day. Well, the, the drop at the locks is about, uh, depending on the time of year, anywhere from 12 to 14 inches. And conversely, the lock in Sheboygan uh, was built way in the early days. I think it was uh, 18 or yeah, 1869 when that block was built. And at that time it was built to wood and only raised the boats about nine feet. The lock that's there today is all cement and pretty intimidating when you're at the bottom, when the water is low, it's about 26 feet. Well, I think that was our last question, but um, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, there's a lot of similarities between our two historical societies and uh, a lot of history uh, of, of passenger ferries and waterways and, and a lot of things in common. And, and so it was great to have you here to talk a little bit more about the inland route as opposed to just Little Traverse Bay where we are. Um, thank you again so much for coming and to everybody who was here watching. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a reminder that the uh, we have several other lectures coming up and other programs this summer, which you can find on our website. Um, there is also uh, the website for the Inland Water Route Historical Society is up on your screen right now. And you are welcome to visit that website and give them a call if you'd like to schedule a tour on uh, their restored boat. Uh, our more recently restored boat, uh, the 1894 AHA, is now an exhibit in Shea Park. Uh, unfortunately, it will not be on the water. Um, it is just a static display, uh, but we hope you will come and uh, see the museum in Harbor Springs and the museum in Alanson. Uh, add those to your, your summer to-do list. So thank you all again so much, and we will hopefully see you next time. Thanks, Beth.